this week. I think most of us want peace to be a place where there is no opposition. Or a place where there is no dysfunction, no disagreement. What we really want peace to be is a place where there is no difficulty. But what if peace has more to do with what's going on in us than what's going on around us? What if peace's presence or absence in our lives has nothing to do with our spouse, our children, our job, our debt, our health, our government, our culture, or even our church. What if peace is completely centered on the condition of our heart and our confidence in the commitment of our Father? Mm -hmm. Peace is a place where there is no confusion. Mm -hmm. Today we're going to see that the conversation between Jesus and the woman at the well took a turn after he had promised that whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, up until the moment when Jesus said this, the woman had asked questions and made objections about every single thing Jesus said. He asked her to give, her, to give him a drink and she said, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? He told her that if she knew the gift of God... And if she knew who it was that was speaking to her, that she would have asked him for a drink and he would have given her, li given her living water. She immediately objected to that thought and she asked him in what was almost sarcastic and dismissive. She said, "How? where is it that you'll get this living water since the well is deep and you don't even have something to draw with? Basically what she was saying is, how can you give me water when this whole conversation started with you asking me for water? She objected immediately. She went on to ask him if he was greater than Jacob, who had long ago dug that well that they were sitting next to, because if Jesus had this living or running water at his disposal, then that means Jacob had never needed to dig a well in the first place. And that's when the conversation changed. In these next verses, we get to see why Jesus had to go through Samaria. While meeting this woman, Jesus confronted the culture of prejudice and he disrupted her understanding that had been built by that culture. And I want to stop there real briefly, but we've talked about it week after week. Our culture is broken. Yeah. Like we sit here and we agree to it, we nod to it, we amen, we wave to it. The culture is broken. But here's what you have to understand about that. We have based much of our thinking on a broken culture. Yeah. So it's not that everything around us is broken, it is that we are broken within us because of how we've been influenced by what is around us. If we're going to announce the brokenness of the culture, we have to deal with the brokenness of our understanding Amen. that has been based upon that culture. Jesus heard this woman's questions and he endured all of her objections without offense. But now he was going to reveal to her that he came because he knew her heart. And he came so that he could show his heart to her. The purpose of conversation is not simply to hear and be heard, it is to connect. To go deeper than the surface, to open our hearts and to receive the heart of another. Jesus made himself vulnerable to her. He made himself weary, he made himself thirsty, and he sent everyone else away. He made himself vulnerable to her so that she could learn that it was safe to become vulnerable to him. This morning I pray that we will hear Jesus' heart and that we will freely trust him with ours. I pray that we will discover along with this woman at the well that the pathway to peace often requires that God lead us to revisit our pain. And when he does, it is not to remind us of where we've gone wrong, but it is to deliver us from the confusion that has been caused by rejection. I want to go back again to what Pastor Flowers said last week. Peace is a place where there is no confusion. This statement is completely biblical. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33 says, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Now, before we dive into our text today, I want to try to define confusion because I think it will help us better understand peace. Most English dictionaries give the word confusion a primary definition of a lack of understanding. 
And so when we hear that you're confused, we hear you don't understand. And what we try to do is explain it more. If you ever had someone explain something to you, you don't get it, and so then they slow down and get louder. They basically say the same thing, but they say it in a slower manner and a louder manner, which doesn't help your understanding. It just makes you feel foolish for not understanding in the first place. Biblical definition of confusion is different than our English definition of it. According to the scripture, the Greek word that is used for confusion in 1 Corinthians 14.33 does not mean a lack of understanding. Instead, it means instability, a state of disorder, and disturbance. See, confusion is not simply when we don't know or don't understand. Confusion is when our lack of understanding causes us to panic. Because we believe we're supposed to understand everything. When the reality is, how could we understand everything? If you haven't been taught, you couldn't possibly understand. If you haven't experienced it, you can't know what it's like to go through it. And so there are so many things in life that are not meant to be understood from the beginning, but you understand it along the course of the journey. And yet many of us, and culture has taught many of us, that when you don't understand there's something wrong with you, or there's something wrong with the situation, and we begin to panic because we either need to get out of this, or we need to fix ourselves. And so we turn all of the attention to trying to understand things that may not be meant to be understood yet. Confusion is when our lack of understanding causes us to panic. It's when we don't know, it's when what we don't know begins to make us question everything we have known. Confusion is when we begin to allow how we've been treated to define who we are. Confusion is when we begin to live from our hurt rather than for our hope. But God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, because God never changes. True redemption means we don't ever have to know what's going on to still be sure of where we stand. True redemption means we don't ever have to understand to be sure of who we are. True redemption means we don't have to have answers to be filled with confidence. It means we don't have to like our circumstances to be sure that we are loved. See, peace is not when all goes well. Peace is when I am convinced of who I am and I am sure of who loves me no matter what happens to go on around me. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom. This is the word that Jesus would have said when he spoke to the disciples in John 14, 27. And he said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. I want to expound on that verse real briefly here today. Because usually when we read it, we say, peace I give to you. And then we jump right to, I do not give as the world gives. And we think Jesus is talking about the giving. He's not. He's talking about the peace. He's saying the world gives peace that's based on what you understand and what you agree with. I'm giving you peace that's based on who I am and who I created you to be. And so those things don't ever change. Don't let your peace be found in things that rise and fall because then your peace rises and falls with it. Let your peace be found in the things that are eternal, that will not change or shake or move. That when everything shakes, these things stand firm. You are loved and you were created by a father who chooses you. That's what gives us peace. And so when Jesus said, Shalom, I give to you, he was saying, I'm giving you things that cannot be taken, that cannot be shaken, and that do not need to be rehearsed or thought of again. Know them. You are loved because I am loving. The word shalom means to be safe in mind, body, or estate. Theologian Doug Hershey writes, it speaks of completeness, fullness, a type of wholeness that encourages you to give back, to generously repay something in some way. Peace in scripture defeats insecurity. It is the antidote for anxiety and it is the quencher of all of our hunger and thirst for acceptance. Peace I leave with you because I will never leave. Peace defeats the fear of and the wounds <coughs> from rejection, which may be peace's greatest gift to us. 
peace is what the Apostle Paul describes in Philippians chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, when he says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do everything, which means any of the previous things I've written about, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Peace is living from the reality of being loved in every circumstance you find yourself in. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. Now, I'm sure she didn't understand what he meant about a fountain of living water springing up into everlasting life, because I'm not sure we understand. It's the reality of the presence, the infilling, the never-fading Holy Spirit who dwells within us. It is this reality, as Romans chapter 5, 5 tells us, that the presence of the Spirit is the reality of being loved by God. That that's His constant reminder to us. You are loved, you are loved, you are loved, you are loved. Why? Because my Spirit lives in you. That's what he utters. That's what he announces. That's what he speaks. Those groanings are him telling us, you're loved. You don't understand what's going on. You don't even know how to pray right now, but you are loved. Live in that place. Love from that place. Pray from that place. You are loved. We make the spirit about what happens when he clothes us. The spirit is about what he does when he infills us. Amen. He gives us a confidence that we are loved, which allows us to be clothed with power because we use the power from the love. If we don't know the love, we abuse the power for our own purposes. The infilling is about being completely loved by God. When this woman without fully understanding what Jesus was saying, when she heard that his water could change her circumstances, she decided at that moment, no more questions, no more objections, I'm ready to drink. She doesn't ask any more questions, she makes no more objections. Now that she heard she won't thirst anymore, she's taken it a step further in her mind. She came to this conclusion. If I don't get thirsty, I won't have to come to the well any longer. See. I want us to remember what we've been talking about. The well was the place where her rejection was at its height. <clears throat> the well was the worst place in her life that, that she went to at the worst time of her day. She went alone where all the other women went to help each other. She went when it was hot where all the other women went when it was cool. She went alone because she didn't have anyone that wanted to go with her. And she went when it was hot because she knew no one else would run into her. She had this place in her life that every time she revisited it, it reminded her of everything she wasn't, everything she had hoped to be, and everything that had been taken from her. And so this is where God met her. At the worst place in her life. But when Jesus says, I'll give you water and you'll never get thirsty again, she didn't just think <coughs> about the absence of thirst. She thought, I don't ever have to come here again. <laughs> she now says yes to Jesus. She says, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. At that moment, this woman saw a way out. She came to draw water every day by herself. She avoided every other woman in the city. She was a loner and an outcast. She was broken, and she was the very embodiment of confusion. If Jesus had something that would keep her from having to face her condition and relive her rejection every single day, then she wanted it. I don't believe she had any thought about healing her heart. But if he could just change her circumstances, mm -hmm. she was all for it. I don't say this to be judgmental, but I want us to really examine our own lives. I believe that her response to Jesus sounds a lot like many of our prayers. Most of us would rather be rescued than redeemed. We believe that a change around us would bring somehow a change within us. Have you noticed how many things we change about our lives when we're trying to make ourselves more peaceful, more restful, more happy, more content? We're always, well, maybe if we get more hours or less hours, maybe if we spend more time together or less time together, maybe if we do this, maybe if we do this, we're always trying to find something around us that will, do, that will help what's going on within us. And Jesus is not settling for what goes on around us. How many habits have you changed only to find yourself in the same position you've always been in? How many things that you are sure that would get better if we just had a little more money? Life would be so much better. Only to find out that a little more money didn't make me feel any better about life. 
If you only listen to me a little bit more, only to find out that those extra conversations make me feel worse about myself rather than better about us. Yes. There are these places where, if we're really honest, we are trying to change circumstances to change our hearts when it's our hearts that Jesus came to change. Yes. Remember this. Yes. Jesus can change any circumstance at any moment, yes. but he works to go deeper than that. Yes. He labors. He wearies himself. He even goes through Samaria to <laughs> heal our hearts, not simply to change our lives. If I could encourage you of one thing as we start out today, stop praying for a life change and start asking for a heart change. Amen. Stop asking him to do something different in your marriage and start asking him to do something different in your heart as a husband or a wife. Stop asking him to do something different in your kids and start asking him to do th different things in your hearts as parents. Start asking him, st stop asking him to change our nation and start asking him to change your heart Amen. so you can be a part of changing the hearts of those who live around you. There's a point where we have to see that Jesus came to confront culture by meeting one woman at the place she hated going the most. Maybe if you and I would start being willing to slow down and meet one person at their most hated and, and painful place, that might begin changing the world around us. Rather than thinking there needs to be this thing from the top, let's start at the very bottom and go to each one that we get an opportunity for and watch a thing explode from one rather than believing it has to fall down from the, from the, from the highest place. If we're not having our hearts changed, it doesn't matter what circumstances get changed around us. To take them out of Egypt, but it took an entire generation for God to redeem Israel from their slavery. To remove the damage, the fear, the doubt, even the expectations of Egypt from Israel's hurts. To not go too far off base today, but that's what we don't understand about our own culture. Being freed from something does not take the bondage out from within you. It just takes the bondage off of you. And so when we callously say, slavery ended this long ago, we need to just move on from it. We don't understand that it is ingrained in generations and cultures. And unless we are delivered from it, unless we will acknowledge it, we will just continue to live with internal bondage no matter what our external things look like. And that's why... Racism and injustice and prejudice have to be addressed by the body of Christ and have to be lived out differently within the body of Christ because there is a root that continues to live in our culture and if we will not address it, if we tell people to just move on from it, we leave them in bondage which also binds us. There's a point where we have to acknowledge what has been so that we can move forward into what we were always meant to be. We can't just look at the outside and say, hey, they're free. God was kind. Mm. God was kind as he led Israel. He led them the long way because he knew they'd just been slaves. They'd be afraid of battle. He led them the long way so that they would find out that I didn't just free you from your captors. I am going to provide ways for you where there are no ways. He led them to run out of food so that they would find out they have a father that feeds them, not slave masters that give them just a little bit, but fathers that give them all that they'll ever need. He led them into places where they'd run out of water and run into bitter water so that they would learn, we've got a father who doesn't make you settle for what's bitter and bad for you. you You've got a father that will turn the bitterness into joy, will turn the bitterness into sweetness. You've got a father that will let you wander for 40 years mm -hmm. while your sandals never wear out, yeah. while your clothes stay strong, and while you get fed from heaven day after day after day. Yeah. The long way is not because God is angry. Yeah. It's because yeah. God is teaching us that through the long way of the journey, yeah. you yeah. will never be left alone. You will never have a day where you're unfed, a day where you're unwatered. There will never be a moment where you don't have peace mm. even when you are led into battle. Thank you, Lord. This is the great dilemma we find.